Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by the virtualinstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with the virtualinstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, where either myself or my good friend and fellow artist and art teacher, Ashley Hurst, tries to create a drawing for you in 45 minutes with some instructions sprinkled in, of course. So uh, we get to torture ourselves under these lights and you get the pleasure of watching it all happen here live. Um, if you are watching this live on YouTube, there's a chat box. You can, of course, post comments and questions during tonight's broadcast and Ashley or myself will do our best to answer them. You put it in all capital letters, that will help me see it amongst all the other comments and questions. Because sometimes the chat box gets rolling pretty quickly here on YouTube. Um, I'm going to be managing the chat box tonight, and Ashley's going to be doing the drawing tonight. So let's welcome Ashley. Ashley, how you doing over there? I'm doing well, Matt. Thanks for asking. I hope you guys are, are doing well as well. So thanks for joining us or joining us again if you are with us last week. Tonight is the season finale of Getting Sketchy, so we'll see how season finales go. Sometimes there's a cliffhanger, a twist. I'm hoping for just resolution. I don't think there's going to be a twist hanger, uh, or a twist hanger. I don't think there's a twist, really a twist hanger. hanger. There it Let's is. Let's hope there's not a twist hanger. I hope whatever not. that is, that sounds pretty <laughs> dangerous. This is the last episode of this season. So uh, this is the end of season number three. The first season, it was just me uh, doing it. Second season, Ashley, of course, joined us. And uh, this is the end of the third season. So this is the 10th episode in this season. We're going to take a little bit of a break. We'll probably start back up at the beginning of the summer or the end of the spring, somewhere in there. We'll let you know, and uh, the best way to know is to make sure that you're on our newsletter list. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, look in the description below this video, there's a link to check out three free course videos and eBooks for free. If you click on that link and put it, your email address in to get those three course videos and eBooks for free, that'll put you on our newsletter list. And every time we broadcast here on YouTube, you'll get an email from me reminding you of that. And that reminds me that we do have a membership program over at thevirtualinstructor.com, which includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of subjects and media. Each one of our courses includes instructional videos that are logically sequenced, as well as illustrated eBooks. So you have two different ways to learn there. We also do weekly live lessons, which are more in depth than what we do here on Getting Sketchy. In fact, after this broadcast, we'll be heading over to thevirtualinstructor.com where I'll be continuing the pen and ink drawing that I'm working on right now in this current series. We have a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers, and uh, there's also weekly critiques, which are part of the Members Minute. So if you want to learn more about the membership program, there's a link in the description below. You can check it out. Everyone starts out for a week with a free trial. So we have a free trial for seven days, so you can go in and check out the program and see if it's right for you. Now, also, if you're new to the channel or you haven't done so yet, you should subscribe to this channel because we cover a broad variety of drawing and painting media and subjects here. Subscribing is absolutely free to do. And while you're at it, go ahead and click that notification bell so you get notified every time we upload a new video. And also when we go live here on Getting Sketchy, I think YouTube notifies folks uh, with that as well. So uh, Ashley, are you about ready to go tonight? Yeah, I think so. I've been studying my subject a little bit while you're talking and um, let's start making some marks. Okay, well, Ashley gets things set up over there. Um, I just want to thank all of you guys for, for being here this evening and just give you a little bit of a rundown how this works if you're new. Uh, Ashley's going to have 45 minutes to create this drawing, and that's kind of a loose 45 minutes. So if we have to go over a little bit, we will. But I want to remind you that 45 minutes really isn't enough time to create a finished drawing. That's why we call this getting sketchy, besides the fact that both Ashley and I are pretty sketchy people. <laughs> Um, it also works for the fact that we're creating sketches here. So a lot of times people have the misconception that creating a drawing or a painting, a finished drawing or painting is something that happens really quickly due to some kind of mysterious talent and that couldn't be further from the truth. There's a lot of work that goes into creating a piece of artwork and sometimes that means hours and hours and hours of work. Um, so I want you just to keep that in mind. This is all meant to be fun. So I'm ready to have fun. I know Ashley is too. So let's go ahead and see if he's set up over there. All right. And I'm going to go ahead and hide your countdown timer because it's uh, already ticking away. <laughs> we're not quite ready for that yet. I'm already, I'm always a little nervous before I start drawing. I don't need, I don't need to see that timer right now. Now I've got my pens out. It's difficult to tell maybe, but they're actually brown, not black. They're Faber-Castell pens. 
Um, small and medium, I believe, are the designations. I'm going to start with a small pen. It's not really that small. I would say it's like maybe just your average Sakura micron size pen. We'll see how the marks look. The paper's not really large either, um, just so that I can get pretty pretty far into the drawing, hopefully, in the 45 minutes of, that we have. So often we think of pen as sort of a precision medium. Um, but if you look at the reference, there's a chess piece to the left that's pretty sharp. And then the remaining chess pieces are out of focus and even um, the further back you go in the depth of field, the, the more out of focus they are. So I'm gonna try to somewhat capture the, the difference between the chess piece's edge quality. So when I, when, I liked, when I sketch, like Matt mentioned, we're not always making a finished work of art. So I like to have a goal in my sketch, what I'm looking at. And I'm looking at the edges, sharp and soft, and I'm also thinking about the symmetry of all these pieces. They're pretty much built out of geometric forms, but they are, and, and because of that, they're symmetric, and so we, we can't lose that from one side to the other. And then also, all of the pieces are vertically oriented. You know, these are shapes or forms that are completely stacked on top of each other. So it'll be really important to, to maintain that vertical um, alignment between shapes. So those are, those are sort of my goals, in addition to, of course, you know, trying to capture the value as accurately as I can, lightness and darkness. And All did right. you mention, I may have missed this, did you mention that you're working with brown ink? Instead? That's right. Yeah, these are brown pens, brown pens. So just to warm it up a little bit, you know, just to feel it a little bit, make it a feel maybe a little bit uh, warm and atmospheric and even nostalgic. I love, I love playing chess. I love games. Um, years ago, I did a whole series of paintings that were based on games and gaming. So this is a subject matter, not necessarily chess pieces, but just game pieces in general uh, that I have in, enjoyed drawing um, over the years. All right. All right. I guess we're ready to get started. I am going to start with a pencil. It's not a bad idea. And I am going to use a 2H pencil so that these marks completely disappear when we erase them near the end of the drawing. Matt, I guess we're ready to get started. All right, I'm going to start the timer right now. All right, here we go. So I'm going to start with the object that's closest to us and then use it to sort of find where the rest of the objects are, how they relate to the first in their placement uh, size and uh, placement on the page. So this, this line here is just meant to be sort of the gesture or the spine of that first piece. And I believe it looks to me like the circle or ball on the top of this bishop is above the middle and pretty close to the left edge. So we'll start right about here and see how the other parts land, maybe just a little higher. And of course, as long as we develop the other chess pieces around this one, then hopefully their relationship will be accurate, even if they don't land exactly on the, on the page where, uh, where maybe they do in the reference. I'm going to shift this over just a little bit more. There we go. So you're making comparisons basically between the edge of the picture plane on the left side and how far up on the drawing surface. That's right. I'm looking at the size of the circle and the empty space that's next to it. Is that what you're thinking, Matt? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people might get overwhelmed like an image with an image like this or really any uh, subject that they're trying to draw and... A lot of times people just don't know where to start. And, um, sure. you know, you could have started on the other side, right? Yeah, You're there's right not there. a really a right place to start. I mean, I think of the drawing as a collection of shapes that fit together like a puzzle. And when we're putting puzzles together, you know, I, I like to start around the edges, actually. But you start with whichever pieces kind of fit together. And so I've started with the circle, and then I'll move, move on from there, comparing the next shape, which is kind of like a cone, um, to the circle in terms of its proportion. And then... I'll continue working down this particular uh, bishop and comparing one shape to the previous shape. So hopefully they'll inform each other. Okay, Thomas is asking what's the size of the reference so I can make a similar box or outline. And I'm not sure we know. Do you know the exact size? I don't know the exact <laughs> proportion. Let's see. I want to say that it was 4.9 inches by 6.3. Just a guess. That's pretty, pretty exact for <laughs> These, a guess. Those numbers are sticking out in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so that may be it. And I, 
And um, I did measure the paper. I'm not sure about the reference, but that would be the the paper that I'm drawing on. So that would give you an idea of the proportion. Yeah, and I really, me personally, I don't really concern myself with having the exact proportional measurements on the drawing paper. Not unless you're using a grid. Exactly. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah. If I'm using a grid or something like that, then I try to make it exactly the same. But if, if not, then just an approximate, a pro approximate proportion typically works. So uh, it looks to me like these two rings that go around our bishop don't stick out farther than the cone shape. We'll call this a seed. How about that? A seed shape. And so I've just drawn a line straight down from the outermost portion of that form's curve uh, to find the edges of these two rings. So you started by using the negative space off the side of the, the left side of the picture plane to figure out how far out you need to make that piece. Yeah, the left, the left edge and also the center. You know, I try I like I to know you. where the center of my picture is. And I did put a dot there where okay. I feel like about where the center was. So I can always mm -hmm. lay my pencil there. And then once you the got that tab. information, that initial information, you're using that information to decide where the other parts of the piece correct. are located. Yeah, that's correct. They're hopefully all sort of uh, building, you know, if we, if we build one part off of another part, then hopefully in the end the relationships will be pretty accurate. <laughs> I'm laughing at what Laura just wrote. She said, I came in late and know that Ashley is drawing because there are no Band-Aids on the fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, tonight, I don't have any Band-Aids on my fingers. Oh, it's all been a good week. It's been a good week. beat-up hands have, uh, all the parts of my beat-up hands have healed enough for me to be under the camera tonight later. So, <laughs> no Band-Aids tonight. Um, Sherry asked, what do you like best, acrylic painting or painting with watercolor? I prefer painting with watercolor. Over acrylics? Yes. That's interesting. Because mm -hmm. you're uh, an, an oil, oil painter. Yeah. It's, I, it's because oil paint is superior to acrylic paint. So Well, I, the option wasn't I'm between just acrylics kidding. and I'm oils. Just, I know, was, I know. I have a preference for opaque paint, I guess, than it's oil paint. Yeah. Now, having said that, you know, acrylic is an amazing material. It really is. And mm -hmm. it can do so much once you get used to using it and learn to use the different additives um, that, uh, that can be mixed in to create uh, sort of uh, different physical textures in the paint. I'm kind of into that stuff. You know, I like oil paint and thick, heavy paint. So I'm into the pastes, the golden uh, pastes that you can add to mm -hmm. your paint. Yeah, I personally, I, I probably prefer acrylics over watercolor just because acrylics are just so forgiving. I've been painting in watercolor lately, so maybe that's why... Maybe that's why I feel that way. All right. Uh, Chicken Nugget is saying, is there an easy way to change the size of your drawing compared to the reference while keeping the same proportions? I can try that for you there, Mr. Nugget or Mrs. Nugget. I'm going to move the uh, timer up to the corner, and then I'll make the, the reference a little bit bigger. And it's not going to be exactly the same, but it's pretty close. Let's see All here. All right. Um, Chicken Nugget also asks, do you prefer mechanical or traditional pencils? I prefer mechanical. Um, for me personally, it's really, you know, almost what kind of mood. Because <laughs> uh, I like working with pencils, wooden pencils, and uh, lead holders. I will call, sometimes refer to it as a mechanical pencil, but it's yes, really fair, a lead holder. It's, fair, it's close. It's like a mechanical pencil on steroids. You know, it's just really beefed up. And are you the same way? Because I know you have one of those lead holders. Yes, too, right? I prefer wooden pencils for the most part, um, except when I'm starting a perspective drawing. All right, so I've got a, I've got a pretty decent bishop right now, and uh, I may change some of these contours a little bit, but it is, we need to move on. You know, there is, this is a time drawing, not just a drawing. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a vertical line, and this is to help to keep... You know, the whole entire time I was drawing the bishop, I was constantly looking at the edge of a contour and the center line that I have now erased, and uh, and then comparing that to the contour on the other side. So my eyes are always going to this center line, and I'm trying to judge the two halves of a symmetric shape. So that's why I need this uh, this next vertical line in for the king. And that's a great tip on trying to draw some symmetrical objects. Because those can be really tough. Without that line in the middle, sometimes it's hard to know 
especially where the curves are, um, what's wrong when there is something that's, when there is a problem. But that vertical line is so stable, it makes it a lot easier for us to make a judgment. Now, for the king, I can't really see the segments that well. See, I know exactly where to start this mark, or, I mean, exactly where to start this mark took me two tries <laughs> um, because of this center line. You know, I can look at this curve and even guesstimate that distance to the center line and then put a corresponding mark on the other side. I, you know, it's just, you're just trying to find your place in the dark without this, what I like to call the spine of our object. Yeah, so I'm going to ignore the segments on, on this object, on the, uh, on the king, and really just focus on its overall shape. Maria asked, do you have to use distilled water to dilute India ink and acrylic ink, or is tap water okay? And um, I think tap water is just fine. Do you, do you know why it would be better to use distilled water? Um, cause, because it's better in every way, I would guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> because it's so pure, but I don't know. Yeah, I guess if you want to have... I don't know if there a could be a, pure, like a light fastness I mean, you're issue mixing it or, with ink. Yeah, that ink acrylic, is pretty so, strong stuff. Yeah, I, I don't think it would really matter. Um, someone asked, why is everyone shouting? And they're not shouting. <laughs> um, if you put your, your comments and questions in capital letters, that will help me and understand that it is a comment or question that I need to read out so that Ashley and I can address it. So that's, that's why it's in all capital letters. I, we're, we know you're not shouting at us. All right, just moving stuff around a little bit. Now, I've made it down to the middle of our king, which is great because I don't have to worry about symmetry anymore. We can't see the other side. Remember, these pencil lines, hopefully, you know, we'll have a chance to erase them and they'll all go away. So I'm drawing relatively dark for a 2H pencil. I just, I just bear down pretty hard. So hopefully that's showing up well for you guys out there. It's a habit of mine, since I do draw on video a lot for my own students, to draw a little darker than I would often prefer for that very reason, just to make sure it's showing up on a screen. Well, showing up pretty well All right. here. So there's our king shape. And then we'll just build the other pieces off of that one. So this king has a little pawn hanging out behind it, which is not where pawns are supposed to be, right? It's supposed to protect their king. I don't know if any of you are chess players out there, but I I dabble. Maybe we're looking from the back of the chessboard. Ah, uh, yes. You're probably right. Or maybe somebody just threw some chess. Or it's just a, you know, it's just a, he's a rogue king. He's, a rogue, he's going to do it on his own. And probably that's what he's supposed to do, right? I'm sure there was a time when a king would be in the front, not the back. That's how you get to be king. For 30 minutes. Yeah, right. right. That's how you get to try to be king. All right, now, this is great. There's an interesting little shape, an empty shape, between this pawn and the next. And so... I'll be looking at that empty white shape between these two just as much as the pawns themselves. So you're, you're using everything you possibly can use to make comparisons to get a, get as accurate as uh, possible that's with, the, right. with the drone. Yeah, that's right. We sometimes forget that our subject is only, in this case, less than half of what we're drawing. There's more empty space in this drawing than, uh, than, there, are, than there is positive shapes or space. Not that we can use it all. You know, a lot of it's unusable, like up in here. There's nothing really to draw. But uh, don't forget the empty space. It's, it counts, too. Oh, somebody, again, forgot the time change. Oh, no. Um, well, you know, they're in Arizona. Right, I was going to say it's changing it. <laughs> oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> so That's where I want to move because of this time change business. Because of the I that, think I'm going to have to move got to two Arizona. I've re two reasons to move to Arizona. The golf courses uh -huh. are beautiful in the middle of the desert. Yeah. And then um, not having to deal with the time change. Well, see, I have different reasons to move to Arizona. Okay, okay. The dry climate. That's I think a great I would reason. I really love that. And isn't there pretty much a lack of winter there, too? <laughs> 
Those oh. are two very good reasons for me. Yeah, that's, that's a good reason. I don't want to forget our little cutout shape over here. Defining characteristic of the bishop. All right, let's see. I just checked the time, and I've got about 32 minutes. Feeling okay about that. I'm not sure if I'm going fast enough. Um, I really want to spend a large portion of our 45-minute shading, which is uh, not something I've done this season. And I've, I've <laughs> just selected imagery that it's taken about 40 minutes to draw, and then I'll try to shade it in in five minutes. And, and they've so. all turned out great. Uh, thank you them. for that. Thank yeah. you. So I'm thinking, you know, I'll spend maybe, you know, 20 minutes with this drawing and 25 minutes with the shading. That's it, what I'm shooting for. It's always a dramatic ending. It is. Where it's, is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? And then all of a sudden it just comes together in a matter of a few minutes. At the end, which is why you have to stick around. But everything is always so accurate, too. Hopefully you guys are drawn along with us tonight. All right. And so it's close to the right place. This little pawn seems a little fussy. I think I'm wide on this side. What's interesting is that pawn there looks like it's actually a different shape than the pawns behind it. It feels you like that? it's shorter right yeah. here in the middle. It's well, the, the little piece something. underneath the ball at the yeah. top is much I'm wondering bulkier. if it's because these are so out of focus, we're losing their edges to the white space a Maybe. little bit. Maybe, yeah. You know, the, the black ones in the back. So That's odd. That's my guess. Now I feel like if I draw this accurately, there's gonna be a, it's going to look like there's a problem. <laughs> Maybe I should spin <laughs> this up a little bit, try to make them match we, a little bit more than they do. Another thing I'll just point out, to everybody who's watching this is notice where the different pieces land in the pitcher plane. You know, some are clearly higher up on the pitcher plane. As you go backwards in space, they're, the bottoms are higher right. up on the, the pitcher plane. The lower the bottom, the closer they are to us. Right. And that's a common mistake a lot of people make sometimes is they'll, they'll kind of put all the bottoms in nearly the same place and not realize how much space there actually is between those kind of things. You know, there's an excellent painting by Rene Magritte of a woman on a horse. I don't remember the name of it, but he messed around with where the horse's legs and the trees that the horse is walking through, where they land on the ground. And he purposely put them in the wrong places to mess with our sense of space. Hmm. I don't remember the name of that painting. It's really, really popular and famous, and it's in textbooks and such. So if you're interested in seeing how messing around with the where where... Um, imagery hits the ground plane, look up, you know, do a Google search for Magritte Horse Woman Woods. And those key words will, will, will find you that painting, I promise. We hope. Um, Jess, Jess says, how often do you guys go live? And um, when we're doing Getting Sketchy like this, uh, we'll, we'll do 10 episodes and then we'll take a little break. And this is actually the 10th episode of uh, this season. So we're going to take a little bit of, of a break uh, after this episode for a few weeks before we start up again. But we broadcast live every single week at the virtualinstructor.com uh, as part of the membership program. Um, we have weekly live lessons, and those drawings are more in-depth. They're usually spread out over several weeks, and it's not just drawings, obviously. We do paintings there, too. Um, so that's how often we go live. Uh, let's see. Douglas says, Ashley, you mentioned you tend to be nervous before these sketches. What part of the process makes you most anxious? Surely this sketch must be a cakewalk after the gears. <laughs> well, I, I think it's just the fact that all you guys are watching. You know, art is often made alone. <laughs> right. And, and, and then some people <laughs> won't even show others their artwork in process, in stages, because they, you know, it doesn't look always completely accurate or right. It's a work in process, so to speak. So I guess it's, it's, it's that. Now, I don't mind people seeing my work in stages because I'm an instructor. You know, so that's kind of what we do is, uh, is work with and through those stages with others. So, but there are, you know, there's some, some stuff happens sometimes. There's a mistake. 
I feel like if you if you didn't get nervous, that would kind of be an indication that you're either a overconfident or b you just didn't care. Yeah, probably um, so. I mean, I, like, you know, you, as you know, Matt and I play golf together. We talk about that, and we've been doing that for years. And uh, you know, I've teed off a bazillion times on the first tee box, still nervous every single time. It's because it's because I'm not by myself. Matt's <laughs> watching me, and he's still watching me. He's watching me right now. <laughs> Matt, turn your head. I'm just kidding. I can't. I can't look away. <laughs> Okay, just a few marks in the background, and we're going to start applying some value. Okay. Just okay. making some little indications of where different values are in the background. Linda says that the uh, title of the piece is The Blank Check by Magritte. That, okay, The Blank Check. That's an interesting I would have title, never but, guessed that yeah. title. Maybe something got lost in translation. <laughs> in in English, it's the blank check. In French, it's woman, woods, horse. Uh, Thomas says, my pieces look a bit, bit tilted. And sometimes when you see distortion in a drawing or painting, it's due to the angle that you're actually looking at your surface. So oh, yeah, could be. Um, if you're like drawing or painting on a flat table, a lot of times that will create some elongation in the drawing because of the angle you're looking at. The way to... To, to fix that or make that a little bit better is uh, to work on a slightly elevated surface, like on an easel, or maybe even just um, take a drawing board and tilt it up a little bit or work on a drafting table. So uh, you got some options there to kind of get the drawing or painting closer to being perpendicular with your eyes. I'm on a drafting table right now. It's tilted about probably eight or nine degrees. Not that much because of the camera that's over top, but it does mm -hmm. help. Just any little bit of tilt does make a difference. All right, I have gone ahead and circled around where some of the highlights are. Not all of them. There's some little grayish highlights on the king that I'm just going to ignore, and maybe we'll find them later. We'll see. And at this point, I'm going to turn my paper sideways. Dun, dun, dun. All right, and it's because I'm, I plan to hatch... And for me, working, making horizontal marks is challenging. Making vertical marks is a little bit easier for me. I'm just pulling the pencil towards myself. This is just how the human body's joints seem to work. It's easier to pull towards yourself straight than to go sideways straight. I'm not really sure why. And I'm not actually going to make completely straight marks right now. Um, this object is very subtle, has very subtle curves in its contour. Uh, and so I'm going to just lay in a few lines that will disappear later on that are just here for me to follow to make sure that I sort of maintain that really subtle curve um, all the way throughout the drawing uh, from, or throughout the piece. And these lines are referred to as cross contour lines. Yeah. And for some folks, it's really hard to understand the concept of these lines, but I think the way Ashley is um, drawing them on here makes it very clear. And of course, you know, I'll be shading along these lines in certain areas. There'll be more pin marks than others, but all of the pin marks need to follow this gentle curve in this object. And that's how I plan to separate this object from the others. They're going to be shaded with straight lines, even though they're round objects, and that'll help to simplify them and push them back in space and further separate them from this one. All right. All right. We've got an official, we've got official uh, correction on the title of that okay. painting. Um, the title is, and this is going to, I'm going to slaughter this. <laughs> LeBlanc Singh. Okay. And apparently the translation is the blank signature. Okay. Not necessarily the blank check. Ah, lost in translation. Okay. I'm going to start with the pen now, and of course our marks count now, and I plan on using almost an outline. Well, what's interesting here is, uh, at least on the screen I'm looking at, the brown marks actually look black. They do. They look... Don't they? Just everybody pretend like we're <laughs> drawing with a black pen. But the, the, as you said, the brown I noticed that the brown, I mean, I don't know if you could tell if I had something. The, the cap is black. Mm -hmm. The pen is brown. They do look very similar. So it is a very dark brown. We'll but it's say definitely going to warm, warm up the image, like you said. Yeah, I hope so. 
And now I notice that you're not being super stiff with these marks either, even though that it's a pin. Uh, you're kind of creating looser marks there with a broken yeah, line. Yeah, that's right. Because um, I don't actually plan to put an outline around everything or anything except this object, truth be told. That's how I, that's how I want to create the impression of soft edges in all of these other pieces. Um, so I want a, something of an outline here, but I don't want it to be too strong. And I feel like maybe the broken lines will, will give me that. Hopefully these, this outline will somewhat incorporate itself into the shading. All right, that's it for the outlines. Now it's time to shade. So again, I'm going to work like I'm a watercolorist for a little while and lay down a light value and then go back on top of that with another layer and lay down a darker value. So at first, I'm just going to create a series of lines across this bishop that are not that close together. And this will become the lighter, the lightest value besides white. All right, it's okay if your marks are somewhat um, disconnected or broken like mine are. That helps your marks to feel like a lighter line than the pen's natural value. All right, Carlo says, are charcoal sticks suitable for shading this? Uh, yeah, you can use you can use charcoal to draw anything that you you wish, but the approach that Ashley's taking here with the uh, the hatching, you probably aren't going to want to use charcoal for that. You're probably better off using a linear medium like pen and ink. Uh, you could use pencil too, uh, of course, but with charcoal, you kind of want to think of charcoal. Even though it's a drawing medium, you, you probably want to approach it more like a painting medium, actually. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay, now with these pencil lines on here that are pretty much giving me immediate feedback, you know, when I put a line down that's not quite, uh, doesn't quite follow that subtle curve, I just try to correct it with the next line. Okay, so more clarification here. Pat says the word S-E-I-N-G is the old French word for signature. The G is not pronounced, so you could say it like saint without the T sound, and it would be close to the right pronunciation. So I guess the correct pronunciation is La Bloc Saint. Oh. Well, I'm going to practice. That was very well put there, Pat. Yeah, that was very well thank explained. Thank you for that um, yep. explanation. All right, so our first value's in, everything except you know where we skip around with white. And I'm going to keep the paper sideways for a little while, at least on this object. And start adding a second layer of lines on in between these. And this is where that core shadow exists down. Right, where I start, where I feel like I see a darker shadow. So and there's, you know, I'm trying to just see about three values right now, maybe four. Just thinking light, medium, and dark. So value is the darkness or lightness of a color. And uh, in this particular image, it looks like we either have two light sources or the light source is actually behind these objects. Yeah, there may be a reflection. I think it's mostly behind. It's, it's where that, it's up here. It's the window. Yeah, yeah, I think it's that window. So that's creating areas of core shadow that face the viewer. So with hatching, um, you know, you, you can be kind of loose. You don't have to be too tight. You just need your lines going in a similar direction in a given area. All right. Now, we won't go, you know, too quickly with building up the value. We'll give this object a few more pass, a pass or two and then get into the background objects and then return to this one and being able to compare it to what we've done in the background. Now, the pen you're using, is that the S pen? Yes. <laughs> Which we believe means small. I have a pen with an M, which I think means medium. And, of course, the one with the B naturally means big. Small, medium, and big. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's a brush tip. I don't plan to use it. It doesn't mean big. <laughs> okay. 
I'll add a little bit more value here on the edge of our object, down low on the cone. There's a little bit of a discussion going on here about papers and mm -hmm. um, chicken nugget. Again, ask uh, what kind of paper is your favorite to work on? And Sherry, I think, uh, has the best answer. She says it depends on the medium, which it really does depend on the medium. So uh, your paper interacts with the medium that you apply to the surf or the medium that you're using. And uh, some surfaces are going to be better suited for some mediums, while some surfaces are not going to play well with other mediums. So it really does depend on the, the medium. I think that's a good answer. All right, just checking the time. We've got 16 minutes. I think that's okay. We've got a lot of white space, but... And Ron says that the B means bold. Bold. That makes better sense, more sense than big. <laughs> <laughs> we were kidding when we said big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got a big laugh out of that before, the, uh, before we went live. All right. <laughs> I've established a relatively dark value up here now, and I'll just try to um, find a similar value further down, referring back to this spot as I do. And then it'll be time to jump into the background for a little while. Now, I like backlit subject matter. It is interesting. It can be challenging drawing on the shadowy side of an object, but when it works, it works really well. Now, notice that you're not, uh, you're allowing the, the lines to cross over each other, even though that this is hatching. Um, and sure. that's just fun, right? Sure. And especially in the sort of a sketching mode, you know, um, mm -hmm. we could go a little bit slower and more carefully with our lines, but uh, it's not the kind of drawing we're making today. So they're going to touch each other, but as long as they're traveling in generally the same direction, it's still hatching. Okay. Ernest says, what about tone paper? Anybody use that? And the answer is yes. Yes. I like uh, Canson Mitant's paper a lot. There are a lot of good tone papers out there. Canson Mitant's paper is one of them, especially if you're going to use pastels. It also works well with colored pencils. Uh, there's also Artigan paper mm -hmm. by Strathmore. And uh, they also make a gray toned paper, too, that's really nice. It has kind of a smoother texture so if the canson paper is a little too heavy for you you've got that as an option uh, so there's lots of tone paper out there that's really really nice to work with there's also stonehenge paper stonehenge paper is made in a variety of different um, colors and tones and uh, it's really great for working with colored pencils and graphite okay let's go ahead and spin it back around for a little while i've got quite a few values in our bishop Oh, yeah. Looks great. And I'm going to go ahead and start working on the object. Actually, gosh, that highlight is crazy big. You need to use the big pen to fill it in, I guess. The B pen. The, the B pen. The bold pen. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So getting into the king, I've got my little highlight circled, and I'm going to start... It's just a series of lines. And this piece is a lot darker than the first. Almost all the way down. Got to get... Got to skip over these highlights. Don't want to get line. Ha I can't tell you how difficult this is to make these horizontal lines. You can see they look like miniature waves. <laughs> I'm gonna, I think I might have to spin this back around. But that adds some life to the drawing. It's, and it looks, I mean, they look pretty good, you know. Thank There's you. definitely less curvature going on with those compared to the, uh, the bishop, I guess. Now, remember, 
we want the edges of these other objects to feel soft or blurry. So going, being too slow and too careful along the edges might prevent that from happening. So I do want to make these lines kind of brisk, not just because of the timer, um, but just to impart maybe a little bit of variety to the edge. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you go too slow, you know, you get a fatter line. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that right now. Not and trying it can to look stiff too. You can make true. the drawing look kind of stiff and stiff and over controlled. Of course, this object will need to get darker, and uh, when it does, maybe we can find some of those gray highlights. Now, here's an interesting comment by Brent Does Art. He says, "I'm worried Ashley went too dark on the bishop," and I know why he's saying that. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason he's saying it is because that's the only object that has any value. There's at all this all, right all this white page right now is mm -hmm. competing against that value. And and this is a good good way of understanding that value is relative. We understand value based on the values that are around it. Because there's so much white on the paper right now, that bishop does look dark. But sure if you look does. at the uh, shadows that happen there on the bishop, then you'll realize that the values are pretty accurate. And that's going to be pretty evident, I think, when this king has uh, got all its value. Eventually, the king there. needs to match that spot, that really dark spot. Mm -hmm. Or the bishop will, in fact, be a little too dark. Or we'll say too high contrast. And then we'll say, I just pumped up the contrast, and that'll be okay. All right, so first pass down the king. And, of course, um, I know this isn't exciting television necessarily. <laughs> this isn't television. That's right. Then we don't and who have calls to it television it. That's anyway? just when, me because I don't, this, Willy Wonka I don't watch television. <laughs> I watch videos on YouTube. I do, too. That's the kind of... On my television. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Matt watches it on his television. Um, television. I think Willie Wonka like came up last call. week. It's, it's like making a call on your telephone. <laughs> you know, who has a telephone anymore? That's right. Yeah. Who's uh, got time for all that? Well, with all of the electronic mail that I get on my personal computer... <laughs> Sometimes I forget what E stands for. <laughs> no. Um, okay, there's a question. Is okay. the reference photo available? It is. Uh, this yeah. is actually a cropped down, slightly edited uh, photo that was from Pixabay. Mm -hmm. um, I do post kind of a write-up of these uh, lessons and also with the video on the website over on the blog. Um Sometimes I can get them up in a week. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than that. I'm a little bit behind on posting those, but eventually this will be posted along with the photo reference. Um, where can we order a brown pen? I've had trouble finding brown. Uh, you probably the internet. Yeah, I um, just may, may have to get it from yeah from a big big distributor on the there. Uh, you know there is Amazon, of course, and then there's uh, Dick Blick, which is another great place. And I'm just going to move this photo reference and move it down a little bit because it's kind of overlapping what you're doing there. And okay, there, so. thank you for that. And sorry we're working sideways, but uh, this is how I like to work with hatching. And I think it may be beneficial for you guys to try working with more, you know, vertically oriented lines versus sideways lines too. That's just very technical. It has nothing to do with skill, just, uh, just position. You know, I've been... As you, as you guys may know, I may have talked about it some. I've been learning to weld, and sort of the position your hand is in and your material is in is really important uh, when, you're, when you're welding. So I'm just going to go across that seam between those two a little bit to pull them together some. I did leave a little gap there. All right. And we'll just keep going with the black objects for now. Now, so, what's going on back here can go very, very fast. So we just have to worry about our mostly our objects. And that when I work on this little object, I'll be referring back to the bishop for value. So if the bishop was a little too dark, but I can make a, 
and I don't I don't know that he is, but if he is, and I can uh, use him as a his own values as a guide for the other values, then it, like Matt said, it's relative and it should all kind of come together. So the timer says seven minutes, but actually you have, if we, we can go, we can go about 10 or 15 more minutes. Max. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we'll need 15 minutes, but we'll see. Um, Sherry says, Hi, Ashley. Love the contrast you're getting between the highlight of the bishop and the king. Oh, thank you. And um, let's see. Douglas says, has, have either of you watched the, the Queen's Gambit? And I have not. I also have not. I'm watching a show right now. I, I said I didn't watch television, but I actually do. <laughs> I was just. I wish I was a person that didn't watch television. I, I, do, I, I watch one TV show at a time, pretty much at night. Something you know, streaming. And right now we've been watching a crime drama in my household called Broadchurch. Hmm. Is, that, is that good? It's pretty good. I like crime dramas. I think it's a. Uh, it's a British show. Uh, Teresa says, I would have expected that Ashley would curve the hatching on the king in the black pawns as he did for the bishop. Well, is there any reason why you decided that? I didn't to, to separate them. So okay. that the bishop is emphasized in this way. You know, okay. it, it's the only one that's really a form, and the others are just shapes. So I've simplified them. Yeah, I can kind of see as, as you go back in space, there's definitely. It's blurrier and less detail. So yeah, you're that's kind of what we're, that's what I'm going for, you know, because it's a pen, it's an unusual medium to be working with a subject matter that's sort of out of focus. So, so that's, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the problem I'm trying to solve tonight is how to handle the variable edge quality, but with a pen. And that's really tricky with uh, pen and ink creating that, that blurriness that happens, especially w w in photography. Yeah, I, I can do it with, a, with charcoal pretty easily mm -hmm. or a pencil or watercolor, but a pen is, is a little bit different. Because yeah. when we work with pen and ink, we're, we're basically using line to do all of the work. Yes, so Lon has to develop the value, which in turn develops the texture and the form. Lon is so important. You have to get creative with how you use it a lot of times with a pen and ink drawing. A lot yeah, of creativity go. that goes into it's pen and ink drawing. Opportunity there. for creativity. Okay. Don't necessarily feel like the bishop is too dark now. No, he definitely he. And I would like to get darker in the king. But the bishop we'll see. definitely stands out now and doesn't feel quite as dark. Again, another example of the relative nature of value. That's sometimes why when we first make marks on the drawing surface, it feels kind wrong. Of they just feel wrong yeah. and out of place almost every time. When you feel like you're doing something wrong, you need to give those early marks some friends before you decide if they're too, too, you know, too anything. It's really interesting how you're just kind of filling in shapes uh, with horizontal shapes hatching. Shapes of lines. And it's, it's slowly starting to make sense. Without, well, without describing everything, you know. Sure, this is the way, you know, this, I'm, I'm drawing with a pen like a painter. <laughs> you know, I don't have really outlines. I'm just trying to see shapes right now. All right, let's see how we're doing on time. Ooh, three minutes. Is that true? Did you, did you That's, put... I have, I have no control over the timer once it starts. I feel like you've put <laughs> extra time on the I could the clock. reset the timer, no. but that's about all I can do. I have not, I've definitely, definitely not taken time away. Okay. But, like I said, we have we really have eleven minutes before we have to uh, start the shift over, start making our transition to the live lesson. Yes. Um, 
let's see. There's some talk about the COVID vaccine. So okay. um, I will tell you guys, um, and without reading all of these comments, um, that I have had my first shot, and so has Ashley. And Ashley is getting his first, his second shot Saturday. Saturday, that's right. And um, after my first shot, I felt pretty tired for a couple of days. And um, that was pretty much it for me. But I am a little bit concerned about the second shot. I am too, just from um, like people I've spoken to and work with seem to do a little bit better with the first than the second. Not everybody. It's not all across the board. I do have a friend who is participating in a medical study. To, um, she takes a test every week to see if she has antibodies in her system and has been doing so for several months. This was a study that was originally started um, to see if there's asymptomatic persons walking around. And uh, she never did have any antibodies, I don't think, until she got her first round of the vaccine. And uh, in the last week, I guess she's developed some antibodies. So the vaccine must be working. And Stephen asked, any particular brand of colored pencil you would recommend? Um, and we've talked about colored pencils a lot here on the channel. Um, if you're looking for wax-based colored pencils, uh, Prismacolor Premier, as Sherry has mentioned here, mm -hmm. oil-based colored pencils, I would recommend Polychromos Pencils by Faber-Castell. Um, do you have any ones that you like other than those two? Not really. I, I mostly just use Prismacolor pencils. Pretty basic. All right. I just heard the music speed up. You did. In my head. <laughs> the, the, Mario, the Mario Brother music right before you jump on the flag. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Yes. We are entering bonus time. Bonus time. Well, you still have time on the clock. It's still 12 seconds. <laughs> Just going to put a flurry, dun, 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 flurry dun, 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 dun. of dark marks right through the <laughs> middle of our king. Now I've got that Mario music. Right <laughs> <in my head. laughs> I've been hearing it for weeks. Oh, have you? Every, you every got people playing, playing. Every no, every time uh, the timer hits about <laughs> one minute, I hear it in my in my head. I started playing that little game with myself. Even when you draw, next season, <laughs> next season, we're yeah, we gonna, need to add that. We, we need, need to add, add that. Some, yeah, some music where things are getting close to the end. Oh, music like that the... very slowly speeds up continuously for forty-five <laughs> minutes. Not just at the end. I don't know if I can pull that one off. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that either. All right, we're All right. just hitting these dark ones one more time, and then we'll erase our pencil lines. Yeah, so the time is up, um, but you can keep going The time there. has elapsed. Keep going. It's, it's, a, it's a suggestion. All right. There we are. Oh, uh, I like it. I, awesome. I, are you going to do some more to it? Or well, are you gonna, I think I'm just going to do your normal little adjustments here while we talk yeah, about it. Yeah, and I need to wait just about 30 seconds before I erase. Yeah, you don't, wanna, mark, so. you don't want to smear anything yeah, there. Probably not going to. I'll be really disappointed if it does um, with these pins, but uh, uh, I do want to give it a few a few seconds away from the little objects before we... Yeah, and to be honest with you, the, the pencil lines really aren't showing up on no, the camera. So That's good. And one thing I really like about this image is um, the fact that, you know, it, it definitely feels like a piece of art, even though it's a sketch, mm -hmm. uh, because of the way that you handled the lines. There's a lot of uh, repetition and rhythm in the piece, and but it's definitely harmonious because uh of oh, the, the a consistent lot of, way, lot of harmony here yeah because right. of the consistent way you use the line uh, on all of the pieces and you know at the same time you still created a pretty strong focal point on that bishop by handling the bishop differently from the other pieces so, well you know you mentioned harmony which is one of our principles of art and it's sort of it's um the other side of that coin is variety and too much harmony can become boring too much variety doesn't 
doesn't make visual sense. So this is extremely harmonious because all of the lines are going almost the same direction. Mm -hmm. And so I need a touch of variety. And, the, and that comes in the slight curve of the bishop and sort of the broken outline around the bishop. That mm -hmm. little bit of variety separates that piece and emphasizes that yeah, piece. So, the, the bishop's the only one piece that has an, a contour. So Right, right. And, and I was worried about it being too strong. So hopefully with the little gaps in there, that keeps that from happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like my goals were um, symmetry, um, to keep the, the shapes vertically aligned, to have variable edge quality, soft in the background, a little bit sh uh, sharper in the foreground, and then try to create a range of values. So I feel like I achieved my goal. Now, um, are all the details there? No, there's a little great highlight that's missing there. And if I had a different goal, that might, that might bother me. But uh, so when you're sketching, uh, my advice is to pick out a couple things you're after and that way you can focus on those and not become overwhelmed. Okay. Uh, Teresa says, looks great, really conveys a mood. Laura says, great job, Ashley. Uh, Thank Priya you. says, great job, Ashley. The bishop is outstanding. Love the shading. Sarah says, love the depth of field. Um, Tom says, did Ashley ever change pins? Wouldn't he have been able to develop more value using the larger pin? Do you want to address that mm, real quick? Probably so. And it, um, that, that's not a, a bad, you know, bad thing to do. I might, I might make this drawing again and use the, uh, the medium pin in the foreground and the small in the background or the small in the background and the medium in the foreground. You know, uh, I don't know that that wouldn't be better. So I would encourage you guys to experiment. I experiment. I've, I, draw, I drew the top of the bishop with an even narrower pin um, before tonight and decided to go with the one that's labeled as small because I feel like it's sort of in the middle of the pins that I have. So... Um, I did consider using one size in the foreground and one in the background. But, you know, once I start hatching, I kind of get line happy and just can't stop. Well, I think that, you know, your image is harmonious because you have the same width of line for the most part. I mean, there's variety in there, too. But, um, you know, if you start incorporating larger lines there, it's just going to be a different drawing. It's probably it, going to be it could become, equally successful. Yeah. Just be different. Yeah, just be different. That's right. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, more comments, thumbs up. Uh, great, guys. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, people really like the drawing. All right, and I hope great. that you guys drew along with me. And if you're not finished yet, keep going or watch a little bit of it a second time so you can see the reference and, and uh, finish one for yourself. All right, all right. I think we're ready to switch back out over here. So, Well, thank you guys for sticking around for uh, the last... Well, almost an hour mm -hmm. here. Just to remind you, we are going to be heading over to the virtualinstructor.com. We're going to be continuing our live lesson series where I'm drawing with pen and ink, ironically, uh, but I am doing a composite image of a lizard man sitting on a couch, and we're doing some experimentation with the pen and ink tonight and because we have some, uh, some issues in the drawing where we have to make sure that we're creating contrast and value, but also contrast in the mark making and the texture. So... Um, we've done some experimentation with that, and uh, that's what we're going to be covering tonight in tonight's broadcast. But uh, Ashley did a fantastic job with his drawing. Ashley, do you want to add anything that we... I just, uh, I'm giggling over here. I got another comment in the chat about me sounding like Matthew McConaughey. So <laughs> I'm getting a real kick out of that. That's great. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think somebody put, uh, all right, all right, I've all been, right. I've man. been hearing this for probably the last 20 years. So <laughs> I love it. Matthew McConaughey is a great actor. Uh, he's got more hair than me, so I'm a little jealous. <laughs> he's got more hair than most people. That's true. Um, Everybody has more hair than me right now. <laughs> All right, guys, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Check out three course videos and the eBooks for free. Link in the description and also the membership program. Uh, this is this does it for this season. Again, we're going to be back in a few weeks, uh, maybe a month or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so make sure that you're subscribed to the channel so you're notified when we do come back here live. And also make sure you're on our newsletter list. Again, there's a link in the description below. And uh, of course, we'll notify you when we do start back up with Getting Sketchy Season 4. So I'm excited about that. I know Ashley is too. But for now, we're going to go ahead and sign out for this evening. Uh, good night, everybody.